So, um, hello, I will talk about uh, practical multilinear maps over the integer. So, it's a uh, common work with Jean Sebastian Coron and Mehdi Tibushi. So, let's start with a little of motivation. So, um, bilinear maps were used, uh, so, were introduced for application a dozen years ago uh, in cryptography, and uh, they are really useful. They are useful for a bunch of applications, for things we, we didn't know how to do before. So three-party defilement key exchange, all based encryption things, identity-based encryption things, attribute-based encryption, uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, and a lot of other things. So it's really exciting. And in 2003, uh, Bonnet and Silverberg ask themselves uh, what could be done if we could, you know, instead of having a bilinear maps, uh, multilinear maps. So uh, they proposed two application, uh, a multi-party DFLMAN with n parties uh, and a very efficient uh, broadcast encryption scheme. So uh, the thing is, we can certainly do a lot of things with multilinear maps application. But they were quite pessimistic about the existence of these maps in the realm of algebraic geometry. So it was an open problem for uh, 10 years. And so at the end of last year, uh, there is this breakthrough result by Karak Gentry and Alevi proposing the first plausible candidate of uh, multilinear maps. Uh, so it's not exactly a generalization of bilinear maps. Uh, they have uh, noisy encodings instead of deterministic encodings. Uh, they introduce a graded encoding system. So it's based on ideal lattices. Uh, they have ideas similar to intro, and it was published this year at Eurocrypt. So it's, in a way, it's similarly flavored as uh, fully morphic encryption. And it, uh, it is actually uh, useful for applications. So they describe uh, n multi-party development key exchange. And so there, there is no security proof in the paper, but they provide an extensive cryptanalysis survey to assess the security. Uh, so following this uh, breakthrough, we have a bunch of work using uh, these approximate multilinear maps. So witness encryption that stuck uh, earlier this year, a bunch of paper at crypto. So the two over of the session and two over on Thursday. Uh, they were the keomorphic uh, PRF this morning. Um, so there is kind of exciting result about obfuscation uh, at crypto, at Fox, and uh, on ePrint, and certainly a lot of other application to come. So it's really, really exciting, but um, in, when we look to the paper, there is no parameter, there is no implementation. If you plug numbers, you know, oh, I want a seven multi-party DFN-man with 80 bit of security, you obtain public parameters really big, terabytes of public parameters. <laughs> but the thing is, it's really new, it's similarly flavored as FHE, so we can hope huge improvement in the next years. So our result is we follow the same approach uh, using graded encoding, but we work over the integers, so similarly to the FHE over the integers. Uh, we are using ideas of uh, Cheon et al uh, of Eurocrypt this year using Chinese reminder theorem. And so it's new security assumption, but there is a surprise is that uh, the decisional linear problem uh, uh, the extension to the multilinear uh, settings seems to be odd in our scheme, and it is not in the GGH scheme they describe uh, the, the first one. But uh, I, I guess uh, uh, Zvika might talk about that later. So we also describe uh, the first implementation of a seven multi-party DFLMAN key exchange. So for 80 bit of security, we have smaller public parameters, so it's only 2.5 gigabytes. And it's arguably reasonable timing for create key agreement. So less than 40 seconds per party. Uh, the, the research source code is available. So it's research source code. It's uh, open source online on GitHub. OK, so let's recall bilinear maps really quickly. So we have this application that goes from two copies of the same group. I will focus on the symmetric setting to another group. Uh, and it's bilinear because if you evaluate uh, 
the, uh, the pairing, it's as if you multiply A and B. Um, so you have a bunch of odd problems, the discrete log and other ones. So the given an element and uh, G to the A find A or G to the A and G to the B find G to the AB and etc. And a lot of others. So uh, the, the perspective uh, taken by Garg and Al was to say, okay, this uh, this bilinear pairing is more or less, you can see A as encoded uh, in the value G to the A. So G to the A is an encoding of the scalar A. So it's easy to encode, but it's really hard to decode. And uh, it, it is actually additively and multiplicatively homomorphic. So additively is just, you know, you multiply G A and G B, and multiplicatively, it's, you evaluate the pairing. So it would be interesting to have the same thing, but for a bunch of groups instead of only two groups. So what they can do is that we don't have this, um, this encoding, which is uh, deterministic anymore, but it's randomized. So it means that an element of the ring has many different encodings. But the thing is, when you evaluate the pairing, which is multiplication, uh, at the end, you can you have a deterministic part in this uh, final result. And you can extract information that depends only on the AIs and not on the randomness in the encodings. Okay, so the idea is to use graded encoding. So you start with, at level zero, you have your scalars element, the elements of the ring, and the encodings are level one. So uh, you, you have a mask actually. Uh, so you're here on the first step, and you can add uh, elements of the same level, and you can multiply elements of different level, but you will grow into level. And at one point, so we'll, you will climb, and at one point, uh, we give you something to extract information, but just only for this level here. And if you're going above this level, you lose all the information. You have something that seems random. Uh, but actually, so there is this little trick that there's a kind of a trap door in the public parameters. But, uh, so it's kind of a problem. But uh, So what is our own proposition for the encoding scheme? So let's assume that lambda is a security parameter and we have this level kappa at which you can, we provide you an information to derive deterministic information. So we have a public modulus, which is a product of a bunch of primes, actually a lot of primes. And we have a random secret mask, which is an element which is invertible mod x0. And uh, so we encode vectors in this ring. So the GIs here are, uh, are numbers. It could be public. And uh, the idea is uh, that the encoding is the only integer so that mod pi, you have ri times gi plus mi divided as by z to the k. So k here is a level of the encoding. So if k is equal to zero, you have a level zero encoding. This is a scalar. And if k is equal to kappa, you will be able to extract information from it. Uh, so actually, it's, um, it's similar to the DGHV encryption scheme for those who recognize it without a random uh, mask. OK, so we have this multiplicative mask, which is used for extraction at level kappa. And this is additively and multiplicatively homomorphic. This is really easy to see. This is just uh, thanks to the CRT. So after addition, your noise is growing. And after multiplication, it's growing way faster. So that's exactly the same problem as in FHE. Uh, so this noise here is without considering the Z to ZK. This is just a numerator each time. Uh, so the problem is now, how can we generate this level K uh, encodings? Because, um, so this is computed by a CRT, so the, this CRT here. But the problem is we don't know the PI because uh, in the public parameters, you just have the product of the PIs. And you don't know the Z, which is a really important masking value that is secret. Um, so. The fact is, in the protocols, we, uh, we have to generate random encoding. So when you talk about um, uh, protocol, I don't know, multi-party development, you just generate random encodings. Uh, so what we will do, we will publish 
in the public parameters a bunch of, a bunch of, um, of uh, random encodings, and we will do a subset sum of them, and we'll use uh, leftover HNMA. Thank you. Thank you. We'll use a leftover hash lemma to, to get something random. So, uh, so what do we do? So we publish this level zero encoding of random elements so that you can uh, generate a scalar, which, is, which will be random thanks to the leftover hash lemma. So you just do a subset sum of it. After you multiply it by a level one encoding of the vector one, so you will get uh, the same message, the same, yeah, the, the encoding of the same element of uh, the same scalar, but now it's level one, so you will have a Z in uh, your encoding. Uh, so this is just a multiplication mod X zero. And after you re-randomize it, because if you publish just this element here, obviously Y is public here, so you can divide by Y and recover the scalar. So you need to re-randomize it. So you re-randomize it by adding uh, subset sum of level one encoding of zero. So this is classical thing to, so you want to apply the leftover hash lemma to, to say that an adversary can distinguish. Uh, so actually it's a slightly more complicated than that uh, because we can't apply the leftover hash lemma at this step uh, because the noises live in some infinite ring and not uh, mod something. So the leftover hash lemma is not working, but uh, so they ran into the same issue in the GGH paper, and they solved it using linear sum with Gaussian coefficient, and we solved it differentially, so we proposed the leftover hash lemma over lattices, so it's, uh, so it's kindly more complicated. We need another subset sum and the noise drawn from specific distribution. Uh, but their approach can be applied to uh, our scheme and reciprocally, so that's interesting. Um, then, so how do we extract this deterministic um, uh, information? So we publish this element, which is a zero testing element, uh, which you see here, we, you have z to z kappa in this element, so it means that you will be able to cancel the z to z kappa in the level kappa encodings. So you have a level kappa encoding, you want to derive some deterministic uh, information from it, so you will basically multiply by this element, mod x0, and you will extract the most significant bit that are only deterministic uh, in the MIs. So why? Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to see like that, so I will just work with one uh, PI, so obviously it's, it's not secure. Uh, so what is the idea? So mod PI, so if we have just one pi, uh, the, the, um, your encoding is uh, R1, R1 times G1 plus M1 over Z to the kappa, and your uh, element here is just H1 times Z to the kappa over G1. So actually, you, you see that you, will, you want to uh, cancel the Z to the kappa, and you want to cancel the GI here. So the H1 here, or the HI here, are small. So when you multiply them, you, you get H1, R1, so you cancel G1 and Z to Z kappa, plus H1 and this element here. And the fact is, uh, if M1 is not zero, you have one over G1 mod P1, which is big. So you will get something which is big mod P1. But if uh, M1 is zero, this cancel out, and the noise will be kind of small, HI will be small, so you will get something which is way smaller than P1. So you, it means that all the most significant bit will be equal to zero. So if you have uh, two elements uh, that uh, encrypt the same thing, so uh, if you do the difference, you will get an encryption at zero. So with the most significant bits equal to zero. So it means that the most significant bits of the two first were equal. So actually, we, we generalize this ID for n bigger than one, and it's working. Uh, so the hardness assumption is uh, the graded DDH, which is uh, the equivalent to the bilinear DDH. So bilinear DDH, it's given three uh, encodings distinguished between the pairing evaluated to the power of the three uh, scalars from a random element. So this is kind of the same thing here, so I won't go through it because I have no time, but uh, 
so we, we are kind of puzzled because as in the first paper, we don't have any security proof and it seems difficult to reduce it to the classical approximate GCD. Uh, but we consider several attacks in the full version of the paper to assess the parameters and stuff like that. So uh, an application we consider and we implemented in our paper was a N multi-party DFM and key exchange. So the idea is uh, you want uh, um, multilinear maps of level N minus one and you want these N parties to share a common key and uh, so for that, they just sample elements, you know, they, 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 they generate encodings at level zero, they keep them, and they uh, leave them to level one, re-randomize it, and publish that. So this is one round key exchange. So every party publish this randomized level one encoding, and so you get the over level one encoding from all the parties, you multiply them, and you multiply by your level zero encoding, so you, it means that you will end up with an encoding of level kappa, which is n minus one, the n minus one over is time plus the zero of yours, and you extract the most significant bit of that. And the protocol is a run run n way Diffie-Hellman key exchange if uh, the graded DH hold. So just really quickly, uh, with uh, constraints similar to the DGHV FHE scheme, for a seven multi-party DFL man and 80 bit of security, so we have a 2.5 gigabyte public key, but this is something you send in a DVD to your user, so this is not something on the network, you know. And uh, each user spend 18 seconds, you know, generating the encodings, and 20 seconds uh, recovering the shared key from all the encodings. So we describe a different flavored multi -lane maps uh, based over the integers, we uh, have a security assessment based on cryptanalysis. We provide parameters for this seven multi-party DFM key exchange. So it's the first proof of concept implementation. Uh, kind of surprisingly, some attacks on the first scheme does not apply to ours. So this is an interesting thing because we have less mathematical structure actually. Uh, and there are a bunch of open problems. So we need new application, how to get rid of this trapdoor. Uh, we need to assess the security since we don't have any security proof. We need to improve the efficiency and reduce the parameter dependence in the level. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for questions. So I have one question. Uh, what would, what's the main reason for the difference in efficiency from the GGH encoding? Is it the, the randomization scheme or the, uh, the fact that you hide the ideal or what's, what's the, the... The main difference between this scheme and the what's GGH... What's the main reason for the efficiency difference? Uh, so uh, we... The thing is, uh, the, the, the described version... Uh, so the, in GGH, there is no optimization whatsoever right. according to the implementation. And we spend quite a few optimization with some of them which are heuristic to uh, try to work on the implementation. But basically, this, our scheme is not really way more efficient if we don't work on the implementation. So we provide several different tricks. 